Greetings viewers, Eric the Car Guy here, back again with, well, it's not a repair video, but with Oliver. Many of you have asked me uh, this year, since I said that starting in 2014, we were going to be doing some work on the Ford Fairmont. Still a bit cold here in the shop, uh, still gathering up funds and making a plan and that kind of thing, but I thought what we could do in the meantime is get to know the vehicle a little bit better, see what I have to start with. I know in the last video we went around and some nice test drives, got some nice camera angles and things, but in this video I hope to like dig in and literally see what, what I have to deal with with this car and basically try to assess its condition so that I can modify it later on. So that is the purpose of today's video. So if you wish to get to know my 1979 Ford Fairmont a little better, also known as Oliver, stick around because uh, we're going to get into it. Let's start with under the hood. Now one of the first things that concerns me is security. <laughs> there's no internal hood latch. The fact that there's no internal hood latch means that, well, anybody can get in here if they want to get in here. Suppose we could start by check checking the oil. It's like a little bit low, but within safe limits. Looks like it's a good color too. I don't think it needs to be changed anytime soon, but it's good to know. This is stone cold, by the way. Cool, it looks, actually it looks about right. You might think it's low, but it, uh, if it's low, it's only slightly low. It's just right to here. Nothing I'm too concerned about. Which your washer fluid's really low though. Power steering looks yucky, but at a good level. You need to start it up and run it for the transmission fluid. Point three liter Ford straight six uh, produces like a little more than 80 horsepower new. A lot of you commented on that in the original video and you had said that's really pathetic for something of that displacement and I'd be inclined to agree with you. Uh, the reason why this has such low ho horsepower is because this block has been used well for some time. In fact I'm not even sure how much time it's been used for but it's been used for much longer than, than the 1979 model year. And what the American car companies, well at least a lot of the American car companies were doing at the time, uh, being the late 70s and early 80s, there were many emission standards that were coming down dictating uh, basically uh, the way of the future. Uh, the things that we drive now are a direct result of that move. So what they did was they used their existing technology which was uh, this engine that they'd had and they detuned it. So they put a different camshaft in it. They put uh, different emission controls on it. This is uh, what's referred to as an AIR system. So it injects air into the exhaust to help the catalytic converter stay hot and more efficient. So the vehicle was detu detuned. It's given a crappy carburetor and you know choked down as far as fuel and stuff. And, and some of you even mentioned the possibility of, of taking this straight six and, and and bringing it back to its real glory and uh, doing it that way. But you know what, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to kind of do this. And lots of you, lots and lots of you have uh, talked about the possibility of putting in a manual transmission. And every time I think about that, I'm on the fence. And I say to myself, you know what, it would be really cool to put a manual transmission in here. But I want people to walk up to this car and just see this. Pretty much just see this as it is. In fact, this interior, this everything has a certain charm for me. It, it brings me back to 1979. Uh, and I like it. I, I like it the way it is. Having a stick shift stick out of here, that would kind of ruin it for me. Um, and, and as much fun as it would be to drive something like that, it would also ruin my whole appeal. So I'm, I'm, not, thinking, I'm not thinking I'm going there. But we can make these modifications. Remember, I, as I said, this is a Fox body vehicle, meaning that uh, it is capable of everything a Mustang is capable of. Now, 
Here's something real important that uh, has been brought to my attention. Right down here is what is referred to as the K member. Um, it's sort of shaped like a K when it's, when it's out of the car, but it goes here, cradles the engine on both sides and comes back in over on this side. You can see the remainder of it down in there. Well, I've come to find out that the straight six and the V8s in the uh, Fox bodies are different for the straight six and the V8, so I have to change that out. It just so happens there's one available from the aftermarket that is tubular. So instead of having a big clunky piece of steel under there, I can have some tubes and lighten the whole thing up, which I'm kind of excited about. Now steering, steering is, well, somewhat antiquated, but it does have a power steering rack. So we do have some potential there. We might be doing something with the steering in these joints, but the astute viewer will note that I do not even have power brakes. And in fact, I think one of the first upgrades that I'm gonna do is uh, to change this over to a power brake system. That would be really nice to have on something that goes faster. Now something that I noticed is if you look at these brake lines here, there's a proportioning valve, but if you look at these brake lines here and take them all the way across, found one that has a compression fitting. Is this bad? No, it's not leaking. Also, this isn't really a performance application and you can see where they cut off the old one down there. Uh, you know, some people would have a real issue with this. Uh, me, for like I said, a performance application, I, I don't want this in a performance application. So I will be uh, replacing this brake line likely at the same time and inspecting the rest of the brake lines possibly replacing those as well, but I've got my cool flaring tool from Eastwood, if you remember, uh, to take care of that with, so I'm really happy about it. Now, this engine has, well, for its age, not so bad as far as the oil lease go. In fact, let's go over to where it uh, lives when I park it. Well, this is where it's been parked. That, I believe, is from another vehicle. It's hard to tell because there were other vehicles parked here that were leaking more. In fact, I think much of this is from that Integra I had for a short period of time. But this spot right here might be it. So for a 1979, I am, I'm not leaking a whole lot. There is, however, one leak that I did find that somewhat concerns me. And that looks like a little bit of coolant coming out of, uh, that's where the head gasket meets the engine block. So that is something of a concern, but I, not really. I, I think because this car hasn't been driven so much, I think that's probably more the reason it does that. This engine and transmission I'm gonna save. Um, that's a three-speed automatic back there behind it. But there is something that I have noticed. This air intake, there's supposed to be a tube that goes from here to here is missing. Also, there's the warm air intake for the bottom of the air cleaner that's missing. There's supposed to be a tube that runs from here down to here. It's not uncommon for that to be gone either. So why don't we take the air cleaner off? This is a one barrel carburetor. That's <laughs> all you need, really. Here's the number, so when you rebuild carburetors, don't throw away this tag. This tag tells you what you have, so you can buy the right kit. Don't throw away this tag. Here's the choke back here, it's electric choke. Looks like somebody put a makeshift uh, little tie on here to keep this connector on. Um, this powers up the choke to make it warm up faster. I just started it up, but let me look down in there. There we go. The inside of the carburetor. Kind of cool. This right here is to uh, knock the idle up for the air conditioner in the days before the idle air control valve. You had little solenoids like this that when energized would kick up the idle. This is the throttle linkage here. Would kick that up. Um, here we have the kick down for the transmission. So it's, it's all mechanical <laughs> for this. So when you step into the throttle far enough, it will uh, put the transmission into second gear, passing gear. A few vacuum lines here and there uh, for different things. Do my eyes to see me or am I looking at some evaporative emissions here? I just might be. I just might be looking at a, at a charcoal canister. Oddly enough, that's so weird. Yeah, there's a line going back to the, what looks like the gas tank and everything. 
Wow, I'm surprised. Uh, so yes, evaporative emission system in this. Um, it's, uh, like I said, this was part of American car makers' efforts to uh, make more fuel efficient vehicles. And the whole fact that this, this Fox body came about because they were trying to make a lighter chassis to speak to that. Before this, I mean, full steel frames, which are very heavy, which is why we needed such big V8s to power them down the road. Um, we take those uh, V8s, modern V8s, put them in into these lighter chassis and we can really move. One thing I'm a little disappointed about is there's not a thermostatic fan here. It's just a straight fan. Uh, the fact that it's just a straight fan means that, well, it, it kind of cost me a little bit of horsepower as a result. If this was a thermostatic fan, a clutch fan as some people call it, that would work a little better. Also, it's interesting to see that there's really not much of a fan shroud here. The fan shrouds are extremely important for helping to draw air through a radiator. Obviously, when I put the uh, other engine in, I'm going to have to upgrade the radiator as well. So there's a lot of money to spend here. I figure by the time it's all said and done, I'll probably have about 10 grand into the engine and transmission. I want to get a four-speed automatic. Uh, and if I have my way, I would really like independent rear suspension. Uh, if I could swing that, that would be really cool. Because I'd like this car to be a driver is what I'm looking for. Let's uh, look underneath and uh, also get uh, a couple of the wheels off and see what we got going on with the brakes. It's a floating car. I say we start at the back and work our way towards the front. Because I know somebody's gonna ask, I don't really like having my jacks extended all the way like that, but I've got them on the pinch welds. And as far as where I lifted it, I did it right in the differential. The front is a similar setup, except for where I lifted it was, uh, you see those two bolts hanging down there? I put the jack right under that and just lifted up the front. Surprisingly, there's plenty left here. Cars of this vintage were not known to hold up well, body-wise. And that's part of the reason why I was so excited to get this one, because uh, that is an energy-absorbing bumper there. I was so excited to get this one because it has a very decent body. Yeah, there's a little bit of stuff with the paint down under here, but compared to some things, <laughs> my Vigor, for instance, uh, it could be so much worse. All right, here's our fuel tank. Lives up under here, sort of shares room with the spare tire. You see there's a little hump right there. It does have a full-size spare. Some of you may not even know what that is. Normal stuff from 1979. Looks like it had a little bit of rust coating on it, which probably helped a great deal uh, with its longevity here. The exhaust seems in pretty decent shape, actually. <laughs> Looks like I got some mud daubers making a nest on my differential. Not sure but I think that that is an 8.8 .8, uh, rear end. Not real sure whether it is or not. That's one of Ford's sizes here. The rear shocks have been replaced. Yes, kids, shocks. Uh, we have a separate coil spring over there. Back in the day, we used to separate the two. It's not like that anymore, but if we were gonna raise or lower the vehicle, I would be replacing those coil springs. You can cut them, but for my purposes, I still want it to handle. So I'm, I'm actually gonna go for the uh, replacement. Also, spring rates, that kind of thing, having new springs. It's nice to have a new suspension. It's all happy and ready to go. So yeah, if I can have my way, independent rear suspension, I think that would be awesome. But I am encouraged by these braces right up here. One here and one here. Also got them underneath on this side. A coil spring suspension is not the best thing for a performance. It's actually much better for a better ride. So far, no leaks on the differential that I can see to speak of, although uh, that fluid may have been in there since 1979. And check this out, in the days before rubber hangers, we had just rubber straps <laughs> that would bolt onto stuff which when these get all rusty uh yeah but get out a torch and you're fine this exhaust is looking really good 
Uh, what about this U joint? Solid. It is a uh, not a limited slip differential, and I'll show you why. This is how you tell, and I, I never would have thought in a million years that it had it. But if it's just a regular differential, when you spin one wheel one way, the opposite wheel goes in the opposite direction. That's a normal differential. If this was posi traction, when I spun this this way, this wheel here would spin in the same direction. So I'm spinning this this way, so now I'll spin it in the opposite direction. So you can see it's just a regular old differential. Uh, not a lot of slop. Seems pretty decent. Oh, it's coming back to me now, these old parking brake setups that were just laying up underneath the body like this that would rust away and uh, cause issues. But once again, we're still in a good spot. Look, we even got a little spring just holding the cable up. And whatever's in the bin, we'll just use it. <laughs> it's kind of what we did in 1979. It's just a... Uh, a frugal time in history, I guess you could say, for American car makers. These floor pans are solid. I'm not seeing anything that looks like it was any, any kind of major collision. In this, you can get a better look at the K-frame. See the, the K-ness of it? Sort of looks a little bit like the letter K. Looks like we got a little bit of a transmission fluid leak here. I spoke a little too soon on leaks. Once again, this is something that's uh, going away in my eyes. It's a lot of work. I mean, even though I've got a nice body to start with, this is a lot of work. There's a lot to be done here to make something like this happen, to do these modifications. But you don't care, because you're just going to sit there and watch the videos. At least I hope you're going to watch the videos. I'm gonna make them, you better watch them. The oil filter, the FL1A, used on many, many, many Fords. Transmission cooler lines, uh, that air conditioner over there, I believe is a dealer add-on. Just your standard suspension, there is a shock, a very long shock, and a coil spring. There's our rack for our rack and pinion. Nothing terribly exciting, but as I said, this whole assembly here has got to go uh, if we're going to drop a V8 in here. As I said, I think having tubular setup up here, also tubular A arms, uh, lower control arms, maybe a stouter a stabilizer bar and neoprene bushings, like redo all the bushings up here, would also be helpful. All of these things will contribute to a better handling vehicle. Ooh, got a missing bolt right here. I think that's supposed to be there. Yep, that's how it's supposed to be on that side. Let's get some wheels off and get a look at what we got there. Some of you might actually remember a time when we had to do stuff like this. Remove hubcaps. <laughs> In fact, hubcaps were a popular theft item for a while. Well, there's a problem. <laughs> there's your problem right there. I don't know if that's inner or outer tie rod. Let's uh, get up underneath and check it. Inner. Can you see it? Luckily, it's wicked easy to change. Uh, why don't we check the other side while we're at it? The other side's good. No movement there. With as much stuff as I'd like to change on this vehicle, <laughs> notice I said like to, I think a five lug conversion is something to be considered. Uh, this just has the four lug nuts now, and honestly, it's, it's just fine. And, and many of them are like this. Even some of the V8 Mustangs are four lugs like this. But they do have conversion kits to where you can convert things over to five lug. And if I'm gonna be upgrading the brakes, which I hope to, uh, there's a really good opportunity to do that. Those brakes look almost brand new. The outside pad's worn quite a bit more. Uh, that may be due to these slides here, what I'm thinking. But that rotor doesn't look that old. Uh, 
um, has the uh, tapered roller bearings on the inside of it so if you change the rotor you change the bearing as well these were the old school wheel bearings that needed periodic servicing as opposed to the new ones that are all a pressed assembly that's weird I wonder what that is oh I know <laughs> that's my AC drain like I said that was a system that was put in after the fact I would wager that that is the AC drain uh, that's there you can see where they ran my brake line down into here. That's something, yeah, that's just what I thought. Something to watch on Fords is the brake lines get old and do exactly this. That looks like a job for steel braided brake lines. Yep, we just like spending money here. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. Oh, it looks like it's got new shocks, both front and back. So there's a lot of encouraging things that I see here. Um, it looks pretty good. So why don't we, why don't we head to the back and see what we find back there? The spring looks pretty goofy back there, doesn't it? <laughs> As I said, it looks like it's got new shocks front and back. Our fuel lines back there. Ultra simplistic in design. Things were much simpler back then in 1979. Why don't we get the drum off, see what uh, kind of shape our brakes are in. I've already got a pan under here to catch any junk. Looks pretty good. Maybe that wheel cylinder is seeping a little bit. Yeah, there's a little bit there. There's just a teeny tiny bit of fluid there. Not surprising with as much as this thing sat, but I'm not, I'm not too worried. Uh, that's not a major leak. I would say that that's more of a, I've been sitting forever, kind of seep is what I'm saying that is. But the brake shoes themselves are practically brand new. So I'm not worried about those at all. But once again, if I have my way, these will turn into disc brakes and it won't matter. But while I'm here, I'm going to do a quick clean and adjust since I'm here. Inside of my drums are looking good too, in case you were wondering. Yeah, it even looks like they changed the hardware. It's still got some paint on it. I'll put a link in the description to my brake drum video so you can see how to adjust brakes. That's about as far as I go. I'll check the other wheels, but that just about covers it. I believe I can show you a little more closely a leaking wheel cylinder just so that you see what to look for. See that fluid coming out down in there? Once again, it's just seepage. It's not like huge. I mean, if, if I pulled that back and a bunch of it came gushing out, that would be one thing, but the fact that it's just sort of dripping out a little bit is not the end of the world, but it's definitely something that should be addressed. However, if these end up getting switched over to uh, disc brakes, it won't really matter. We only want to spend our money where we need to. All right, here on the left side, let's uh, go for the prime suspects first. And as I'm expecting, we have yet another cracked brake hose. Uh, there's our new brake line coming down. Uh, it looks like, looks like they did it on both sides. Uh, except for this one, they didn't use a compression fitting because it's so close to the master cylinder. I think they just didn't want to run that whole line. It actually looks like the pads on this side are worded a little bit differently. Um, I'm going to chalk that up to a possible brake service issue. Uh, with cars that sit like this for long periods of time, not uncommon, not unheard of uh, to find stuff like that. But it's, it's just not that much of a discrepancy for me to really care about. Um, we saw that at least the suspension components on this side were looking pretty good. I think for what I paid for this car, I think I got a pretty good deal. I've got a really good template to start with. I've got some really good stuff that, that I can work with here. The interior, well, I plan to keep that as stock as possible. You see those rockers look really nice. I mean, it's doors are solid, not a whole lot of rust, a little bit of scuff marks here, but that gives character. 
The interior itself is faded and old, so what? I mean, that's kind of what seat covers are for, if I really wanted to go there. But the carpet is good, headliner is good, you know, the glass is good. Really not a lot to complain about. Here's something I'll share with you that's kind of, kind of funny. These cars were, well, let's just say back, back in 79, we made things cheap in America. <laughs> Very cheap. So cheap they couldn't put a slip ring underneath the steering wheel for the horn. So this is actually the horn, watch. You, you push this in like this in order to get the horn to work. Uh, pretty sexy. Outside of that, we just have an honest car. If this was broken when I got it, it looks like it was glued together. It looks like somebody probably tried to hit the horn, realized the horn wasn't there, or <laughs> got pretty upset because it wasn't working. Lots of you made fun of me for my cup holder, but you know what? <laughs> these were what you had. Uh, these would hold cassettes up in here, change over here, your different sized drinks, maybe perhaps a pen would go here. Simple. I do have, well, if I take this down, it does have a ashtray, but no cigarette lighter, which is interesting. Uh, so it's never been smoked in. That's a good thing in my opinion. But yeah, a little bit faded, a little bit old, a little bit crusty, but honest. You know, it's just a honest little car. And when I change the power brakes, that brake pedal is way far up. I'm hoping when I get power brakes that it's closer to the floor. I'll get a different brake pedal for it uh, so that it is closer to the floor. But I mean, you have to lift up a long ways to get to that brake pedal. I'm hoping to uh, do something a little bit different there. Uh, and as I said, I'm hoping with power brakes, perhaps uh, that will help alleviate that issue. And that's my Fairmont. Not in that bad of shape. Brake hoses, uh, right inner tie rod. What else do we find? Oh, a couple of slightly leaking wheel cylinders. Outside of, well, the tires are a bit old too. But I'm not gonna use a lot of those things. So it's kind of like, eh, I drive it around locally. Nothing really much on the highway or anything and I think I'll be just fine. That way I can keep stretching its legs, keep being familiar with it, but you know, it's just like most things. Money and time is what it's gonna take. Uh, two of things which are in short supply for me at the moment, but I'm working on that. You know, it's, this is definitely something I wanna do and move forward with. I thought I'd do this video so that you had a better idea and I had a better idea of what I, what I have to work with with this car. And I think I have quite a bit. Most of what I'm doing is going to be upgrading the mechanics. I'm, I'm really, well, I. I think aside from washing it, I don't think I'm going to do anything to the body. Perhaps at some point I could, but I, as ugly as this color is, this, uh, this color is so ugly to me it's good. And it's not, it's not what you usually see. You don't see a whole lot of cars this color. And I, for whatever reason, I like it. Some of you want me to keep it all original. You're right, it's a good car and it would be a good candidate for that. What I want from this car by the time all said and done, I, I don't necessarily want the thing going like, you know, 10 second quarter miles. That's not exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, what I would be looking for is a nice zippy car, but one that I could jump into and drive to California. Drive all of Route 66 even. That might be fun. Or drive it out to car shows, like I said, in California. And drive the Pacific Coast Highway in it. I'd like it to be able to handle and perform and do well. So I'm thinking fuel injected V8. I, I debated on this for a while. I kept thinking carburetor, kept thinking carburetor, but like I said, I want to be able to jump in this and go. So I would love to have, I would love to have fuel injected V8. I, th I think that that might be the direction that I go. Uh, as far as transmission, I want four speed, I want overdrive. As far as rear end gears, I'm looking to put 373s in the rear. And as I said, if I can swing it, I know they probably got something out there for independent rear suspension for Mustangs. I'm gonna look into it. Uh, and independent rear suspension. That way I can handle. Uh, I'm gonna put some bigger tires on it, obviously, better tires on it. Uh, so that might be one of the things to give it away. Dual exhaust, also gonna give it away. Uh, as far as catalytic converters, that would be a good question because the environmentalist side of me says keep the catalytic converters. The other side of me says if I don't have to run catalytic converters, I might not. But with the fuel injection, I would say I'd probably get my emissions about the same as I am with the straight six. 
uh, but we'll see. Uh, the only way to prove that is to actually check the emissions before and after such a swap and see if my NOx emissions are in a place to where a catalytic converter would be warranted. All this is pure speculation and science for down the road, but yeah, yeah. As far as the stereo, um, I don't even care. Um, I'm probably just going to listen to the rumbling sounds of a V8 as I drive down the road, and I'll be completely content with that. I will be completely content with that. Uh, but I don't know. I don't, things change. If I can find some way to put it in there and keep it looking stock, yeah, but in my last Ford, what I did was I took the radio out and I put a set of gauges in place of it. That might be another option since this is a little light on gauges, and actually, if I put a, a tachometer where the fuel gauge and everything is, I think I'll be much better off with the fuel gauge and stuff elsewhere. But like I said, want to keep it try to look as stock as possible. We'll see. We got we got some planning to do. The next next video I want to do is I'll sit down and I'll come up with a plan. We'll talk about finances. We'll talk about how it all gets put together. How I hope to put it together. I'm going to do the research. It's going to take me a while to put that together, but at least now we got ourselves a Fairmont video out there. So I'm going to quit talking. We're going to move on and uh, hopefully fix some stuff in the next video. I am Eric the Car Guy. You can always find me at ericthecarguy.com and if you have automotive questions I would ask that you go to ericthecarguy.com watch the welcome video and use the myriad of things that we have at ericthecarguy.com to help you with your automotive issues if you wish to connect with me socially I can be found on Google Plus, Facebook and Twitter and I close each of my videos with be safe, have fun and of course stay dirty I'll see you next time